It's no secret that Disney isn't doing well lately. They just laid off nearly 15% of the workforce at Pixar, their movie studio that used to produce guaranteed hits. But Pixar's recent films, Elemental and Lightyear, were bombs, and the division hasn't turned a profit in more than two years. People just didn't go for the strained interracial immigrant metaphor in Elemental or the same-sex kiss in Lightyear or the kind of rehashed, stale vibe of both projects. Additionally, Disney's much-touted, fully immersive Star Wars hotel called the Galactic Star Cruiser shut down late last year after operating for less than two years. Disney had spent hundreds of millions of dollars on the project, apparently on the theory that people cared so much about the Star Wars brand that they'd be willing to spend thousands of dollars for the privilege of staying two nights in a windowless concrete building posing as a spaceship. That didn't pan out. Apparently, people aren't excited to stay in a hotel where the experience is seemingly designed to be as aggressively unpleasant as possible. That same quarter, Disney's streaming service, Disney Plus, reported a loss of more than a million subscribers. And that's not even getting into the uh, Disney's decision to get involved in Florida politics on the side of activist teachers who want to talk to kindergartners about gender identity and sexual orientation. Faced with this brand collapse, Disney had two options. One option was to retool their content to focus on entertainment and family values instead of activism, which is what Disney used to do when it was a universally beloved and much more financially successful company. They could get get back to their roots, in other words. And not in the sense of churning out more remakes, but in the sense of being a company that makes wholesome family films that capture a real sense of wonder and imagination. But the other option was to keep doing exactly what they've been doing and continue to shove the same agenda, the equity, representation, LGBTQ approach that they've been pushing for years now. Well, eight months ago, Disney CEO Bob Iger uh, publicly pledged to pursue the first option. He declared that Disney would refocus its efforts on entertainment, not political messaging. That was the plan, or at least the plan that was shared with the public. But that's not what has happened. Disney, over the past eight months, has apparently decided to double down on agenda-driven content to the point that they're now openly attacking their own fans. It's a remarkable turn of events, and it's one that's worth discussing because it's, this development is not unique to Disney. And it suggests that wokeness as we call it, may not be the best way to describe what we're seeing at Disney and other major corporations like it. And certainly, that's part of what we're seeing, but there's something else going on here as well. It looks a lot like corporate mediocrity run amok, the private sector version of what we see across the public sector bureaucracy. Unimpressive people with impressive sounding credentials who check the right demographic boxes are taking the helm of businesses and products that they don't understand. They've insinuated themselves into these companies like a cancer that's evidently impossible to remove. And even when the company CEO publicly tells them one thing, they're free to do another. Now, to get a better idea of of what I mean, take a look at this interview from the other day featuring uh, Leslie Headland, the creator of the new Disney Star Wars show, The Acolyte. Now, I don't want to prejudice you in any way, so I'll just play the clip with, uh, with no further introduction. This is the showrunner. Uh, talking about uh, her new show, watch. I want to ask you both because this is, I would say, arguably the gayest Star Wars I think, by a considerable <laughs> margin. And uh, are you excited no. about that? Are you Not bracing the yourself? Star Wars. Not the- <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty gay. Let's be honest. <laughs> Wesley, are you? How do you feel? Am I gay? You, yes. Well, no, I know yeah. you are gay, but I'm asking: Are you excited about putting this? You know, this is going to be a talking point. Is it going to be a talking point? I'm sure so. Because nerds ins- are gay. Well, yeah. not, well, some nerds are very not gay and are very threatened by gay stuff. Well, that's stuff. true. But yeah. in my world, nerds are gay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> was, was this the fun element of? No, we, okay. I don't think so. And yet, people have told me that it's the gayest Star Wars, and I frankly, you're offended. Into it. No. <laughs> I think that Star Wars is so gay already. Okay. I mean, have you seen <laughs> the fits? <laughs> We'd be like, look how gay this is, and then send each other a reference photo. And are you telling me, with a straight face, that C-3PO is straight? They're a couple. <laughs> That's what I think. But <laughs> this is more outward. I think it's canon that R2-D2 is, is a lesbian. So don't worry about the story or the plot or the characters. Who has time for that? Instead, just listen to these two women call old Star Wars characters gay and then giggle like schoolgirls. They're excited that this new Star Wars show will be the gayest Star Wars show yet, which is in every way the exact opposite of what the audience actually wants. No, nobody has watched the recent Star Wars uh, sh- films and shows and said to themselves, you know, this would be better if only it was even gayer. No one has thought that, except for apparently the people behind this show. 
Now, the only thing you learn from that interview is that Leslie Headland is gay and has no respect whatsoever for her, her audience or her own show. This is how Disney is promoting the latest entry to franchise. They spent $4 billion to buy a decade ago. And that has a lot of fans wondering how exactly she was chosen for the role of showrunner. If her role is to push some subversive woke ideology, she's not being very subversive about it. She's just angering as uh, many fans as she possibly can. And that's you know all this is. And she's not the only CEO, uh, the only one doing this. The CEO of Lucasfilm, a woman named Kathleen Kennedy, just came out in defense of her showrunner. Kennedy declared that if you're not a fan of uh, how Leslie Headband is, Headland is, is handling herself, then you probably hate women. Quote, I think Leslie has struggled a little bit with it. I think a lot of the women who step into Star Wars struggle with this a bit more. Because of the fan base being so male-dominated, they sometimes get attacked in ways that can be quite personal. My belief is that storytelling does need to be representative of all people. That's an easy decision for me. Yeah, she really said that. Storytelling does need to be representative of all people, says the CEO of Lucasfilm as she mocks her own fan base. These people are so dumb, they don't even understand the words coming out of their own mouths. Representative of all people? Really? Are they going to have 8 billion characters in this show? One for each person on Earth? How exactly does that work? Is storytelling supposed to be representative of all people, whatever that means? Or is it supposed to be representative of the creative, distinct creative vision of the storyteller? I was going to show some more clips of these women, but it's honestly too painful to subject you to. These are people who can't even communicate without descending into valley girl nonsense. And they're putting together shows that they expect millions of people to watch. Kathleen Kennedy was lucky enough to work with Steven Spielberg, and Leslie Headland worked on rom-coms with titles like Sleeping with Other People. So those are their credentials, and they're considered impressive in the industry, I guess. So they get to continue butchering Star Wars. By the way, The Acolyte was released this week. I think it was released yesterday. And um, as has become a new tradition for Star Wars films and shows, it, w- it has a very high critic score on Rotten Tomatoes, like 88%, but a failing grade of 45% from the audience. That's, that is the dynamic we always see now with these things. Joel Berry, who apparently subjected himself to at least some of the show, offered this review, quote, The Acolyte is a queer Marxist vandalization of the myth of Star Wars. In The Acolyte, the Force is a metaphor for cultural hegemonic power. The Jedi are a metaphor for cisgender white oppressors who hoard the power for themselves. Yes, it really is that obnoxious and stupid. The account Wall Street Silver offered uh, this viewer warning, uh, quote, The Acolyte Star Wars new series streaming is very woke. Number one, main character has two mothers. Number two, main Jedi characters are all black and Asian, no white men. And number three, only speaking role for white men in first episode is prisoners on a prison ship. So Disney has decided to right the ship by ramming it directly into another iceberg. That's not to pick on the Acolyte too much, although it obviously deserves it. Uh, because of the fact that Disney is now pumping out Star Wars shows on an assembly line, there's another one that I can mock as well. It's called Tales of the Empire. This one is apparently geared towards kids, and I guess it features a non-binary Jedi based on how all the characters use they, them pronouns to refer to this corpse. Uh, watch this. I think, we've, I think we've played this once before, but here's, it, 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 here it is again. Uh, if you can get through it, here it is. Watch. <laughs> They're still alive. We need to get them to the ship. We can save them. Forget it. Let them die. It's not worth the trouble. They were about to surrender. Irrelevant. The Jedi are a threat to be eradicated wherever they are found. Oh, yeah, we did play that before because that I remember now. That's the one where uh, the bad guy, I guess it's the bad guy, kills some, someone, but then still respects that person's pronouns after having murdered them. So that's, that's nice, at least. This is the result of Disney's big plan to focus on entertainment and not messaging. We have non-binary Jedis and girl bosses making sure we have the gayest Star Wars ever. And that's not all. As Bloomberg recently reported, Disney is now banking on the upcoming film Inside Out 2 as the, quote, key to restoring the magic. They think that this film, a sequel to a movie from 2015, is going to be a smash hit to the point that they're going to give it a 100-day run in theaters. As Bloomberg reports, quote, if families show up for Inside Out 2 in the kinds of numbers Pixar used to see, it will reaffirm the studio's standing. But if the movie fails, it will fuel concerns about the company's relevance. 
And, uh, and by the way, the, the whole article is kind of funny because it's all about how Disney, they've come up with uh, their brilliant strategy to um, get, get back on track. And their brilliant strategy is to do more sequels and remakes. That's the strategy. And of course, anyone reads that, well, isn't that what you've been doing the whole time? Isn't that the only thing you've done for, for 20 years now? Now, what is Inside Out 2 going to be about? Uh, it's hard to say because it's not out yet. But after some Googling, I came across this headline from an outlet called Pride.com. And here's their assessment based on the trailer. Quote, the long-awaited sequel to Disney and Pixar's Inside Out isn't hitting theaters until the summer. But the official trailer dropped this week, and it's looking a little gay. Fans think Inside Out 2 is going to be gay as F. Now, how brave is that? Are they also going to, they're also going to, I guess, gayify Inside Out, or maybe they will, which was kind of a middling Pixar entry in the first place. Is that the direction they're going with it? Who knows? But based on the fact that they can't make anything that isn't gay anymore, we can assume that the answer to that question is probably yes. And all of this is very woke. That's true. It's also incredibly lame and stale and unimaginative. Uh, and that would also be an apt descriptor for what Disney is doing with its theme parks. As the writer Peachy Keenan documented on Twitter yesterday, Disney is currently re-theming their famous Splash Mountain ride because the, the ride was racist for some reason. And they're creating a, a politically correct version of the new ride, so they're doing this even with the rides now. Keenan watched all the Disney's promotional materials, and she put together a comparison of the old ride with the new one. Basically, the new ride won't have Princess Tiana in a nice dress with a handsome prince or even a storyline of any kind, I guess, because that's uh, too, you know, uh, uh, archaic and patriarchal. She wrote, quote, instead, you get a lot of dead space, repeated boring animatronic who look like zombies compared to the pirates animatronics. And Tiana, incredibly, in ugly baggy pants, no makeup, no nonsense hair, zero glamour. It's girl boss Tiana, and she's dressed like a jungle cruise. That's the direction they're going with their theme parks. Sounds thrilling. I was trying to figure out why all this is happening at Disney, um, why they're sabotaging their own brand, despite what the CEO said they do. And it's clear that whatever's going on here, it's not unique to Disney. Consider what just happened at Cracker Barrel. Their CEO is a woman named Julie Fels Massino. She took the job last year. Previously, she worked at Taco Bell, Mattel, Sprinkles, Cupcakes, Starbucks, and Macy's. Of course, the clientele of every single one of those companies is, is different from the typical Cracker Barrel uh, clientele, which skews older. But in general, her old jobs were mostly in the food industry, just like the Acolyte showrunner's jobs were mostly in the entertainment industry. And that's good enough. So Julie Massino got the job. Unfortunately, it's not working out too well. Massino just announced on a call with investors that the company is, quote, just not as relevant as we once were. Because, you know, when you think of Cracker Barrel, you think of something that you want, you think of relevant that's that's why that's why Cracker Barrel's customers go there is because it's it's so relevant. But now it's not as relevant, so they need to they need to make it relevant again. She said, and to ignite growth, she said it's necessary to revitalize the brand. Brand. She then outlined a bunch of generic initiatives like rewards programs that every other restaurant offers, and her announcement. Because people know what that really means when you have one of these uh, one of these you know uh, corporate. One of these mediocre corporate people saying that we're going to revitalize and the brand and make it relevant again. Everyone knows what that means. Everyone knows where that goes. And because of that, the stock went down 11% immediately, putting it down nearly 50% in the past year. And why wouldn't the stock drop? The new CEO clearly views Cracker Barrel as completely indistinguishable from every other place that she's ever worked. If anything, she probably hates the brand. And we can assume she hates the brand's primarily blue-collar Christian clientele. We saw something similar with that uh, Bud Light Vice President Lisa uh, Alyssa Heinerscheid, when she dismissed her own customers as fratty and said Bud Light needed to rebrand, and that's when they brought on Dylan Mulvaney, and we all know how that turned out. So Alyssa Heinerscheid, like Julie Messino, had great credentials. She went to Harvard and Wharton, had worked at big companies like Listerine and General Mills, but she didn't understand Bud Light or care about the customers. In fact, she hated the customers and was very open about that, and so she destroyed the brand. Now the same thing is probably unfolding at Cracker Barrel. And it's a very slow motion, preventable collapse. On social media, someone using the handle Pine Bear and summed up the problem better than, uh, than I've seen elsewhere. Here's what he wrote, describing an alternative to Cracker Barrel's current CEO. He said, quote, imagine a CEO who actually loved Midwestern and Southern culture. What about pop-up concerts and endorsements by Zach Bryan and Morgan Wallen? Why not lean into its heritage as an after-church spot and create programs for church groups, including discounts and shuttle bus services? 
Grassroots evangelical support has made huge hits of movies like The Sound of Freedom and restaurant chains like Chick-fil-A. Imagine a public company with a leadership that didn't hate the blue-collar evangelical population. There are so many obvious partnership opportunities with brands like NASCAR or country music stars. I don't think this is wokeness or girl bossery per se, but rather typical corporate mediocrity. They hired a generic MBA type who built a career on the massive brand equity of Yum! Brands and Starbucks. Just a cog in the corporate machine. I hope we'll see titans of industry again, but this is not how we'll get them. That does a fairly good job of putting into perspective everything we've been seeing over the past few years at Disney, Bud Light, so many other major corporations. And I think it's a more apt explanation than simply chalking all this decline up to wokeness. This trend of hiring interchangeable CEOs with resumes and trendy demographics has been an unmitigated disaster because it overlooks what the leader of every company should have at a bare minimum, which is an understanding of their product and a genuine respect for their customers. And without that, you get shows like The Acolyte. You get Dylan Mulvaney and angry customers, and your stock collapses along with your brand. All the combined efforts of feminism and diversity and equity and wokeness have brought us to this point, all of those things together. But it's bureaucracy and inertia that keeps it alive long after everyone's tired of it. And that inertia is the reason why, whether you're going to a restaurant or a movie theater, you're now guaranteed a product that's as mediocre as the people who created it. Thanks for checking out this video. If you'd like to listen to my full podcast on the go, you can check out The Matt Walsh Show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts.